Welcome everyone to this session about Action Learning Labs. My name is uh, Tor Moyniken and I'm here for my 35th reunion. A few, <laughs> a few years ago, the MIT Alumni Club of Norway organized a breakfast meeting at the US Ambassador's residence in Oslo, where I live. The guest speaker was the president of MIT, Rafael Reif, who spoke about MIT's recent developments and the progress in e-learning and introduction of some of the courses to an international audience. It was very impressive and it made me feel proud of having studied at MIT. And it certainly also inspired me to come to this reunion, which is the first I attend. Today, I'm honored to introduce our guest speakers, Michelina Jester and Simon Johnson. They will discuss the method driving the Action Learning Lab and how the process enhances, enhances student capabilities through the integration of theory and real-world practice, and thereby develop principled, innovative leaders. When Jesse Ruft asked me to introduce them, I asked for a fact sheet on both of them, so I could say something meaningful about them. And their achievements are indeed impressive. As lecturer and G-Lab course manager of MIT Sloan, Michelina is responsible for leading the design and delivery of experimental and project-based courses while developing and supporting learning objectives and learning transfer for multiple stakeholders, stakeholders including faculty, graduate students and host companies. Michelina's work at MIT Sloan draws from her private and non-profit sector experience in strategic management consulting helping to link theoretical concepts to real-world business practice for MBA and other graduate students. Simon Johnson is a Ronald A. Kurz Professor of Entrepreneurship at MIT, as well as Senior Fellow at the Peterson Institute for International Economics in Washington, D.C. And he's a co-founder of BaselineScenario.com and a member of the FDIC's Systemic Resolution Advisory Committee. Professor Johnson uh, works at the heart of Action Learning Labs at MIT Sloan, including the Global Entrepreneurship Lab, which will celebrate its 15th anniversary in the upcoming year. Over the past six years, Professor Johnson has published more than 300 high-impact pieces in high-profile newspapers and professional trade journals. Please join me in welcoming Michelena Jester and Simon Johnson. Uh, thank you very much, Tor, for uh, that very nice, uh, nice introduction. Welcome back to MIT. Hope to see you again uh, more quickly than another 30, 35 years. Uh, welcome, everybody. It's nice to see a lot of, a lot of old friends and, and, uh, and I think some new friends. Thanks for taking an hour and a half out of your day to, to um, spend some time with Michelina and, and myself. And, and I hope to kick some ideas around. I mean, my, my view of any classroom at MIT is we're always trying to, I'm always trying to learn something uh, from you, and, and I think it's often, often the reverse as well. And, and, and I, I think our mandate is to talk about action learning, talk about we're going to celebrate some of the things we've done, and I think we've actually made some, some good progress uh, on, on this over the past uh, two decades. But I absolutely want to try and figure out with you what else we should do. What should we do next? Where does this go? We have some ideas. I want to hear your ideas as well. So we're going to divide it up. I will say a few things at the beginning. I'm a very um, interactive, uh, chalk on the blackboard kind of person. Uh, my forte is, is getting the discussion going. I'm extremely disorganized. No, no, no I don't want to go that far. I, if Michelina's forte is being highly organized and structured. So I will say some few, I will try and get us warmed up a little bit and engaged with the topic. Michelina will then come in and explain the structure of what we've done and how some of the pieces fit together. And then we're gonna, I, I will come back and, and try and brainstorm some ideas with you that are, that are forward looking. Um, and, and I'll tell you why I think we've had some success, particularly around G-Lab, the global part of action learning that, that I specifically uh, work on and, and help to found. Uh, why I think that has gone well and, and where I think it can go and also where we've hit some limitations and some constraints. And, and I'd like to precisely kick around with you whether those are real constraints, whether there are ra ways around them and so on. Uh, uh, That's the MIT way. Come on, you have to admit. Uh, so, let's start off. Let's start off interactively. So, what I was going to say, what I, what I, the way I was going to define it, I think it's a very fair question. The way I was going to so, action learning means different things to different people. Okay, and and action learning has come to mean 
at Sloan at this moment, although I think it's different, it can have also have different meanings across in different parts of campus, but it definitely means things that we do that are not standard classroom exercises. So actually, what I'm doing now is a little bit standard, right? So I'm sitting, I'm standing in front of a classroom, I'm trying to get you involved in discussing. That's a very run-of-the-mill, long-standing business school idea. Anything that involves a project, getting you out of the classroom, anything that involves working with a company, or something, some, some outside, outside constituents, and I'll, I'll talk about some of the pieces, and Michelina will show you more of the structure of that. The, the origin, for those of you, I, I see there are, the, so we've had a big push on this since uh, the mid-1990s. Um, but there, there is a, a very long-standing um, antecedent of everything, certainly everything that I've been involved in, which was eLab, or Entrepreneurship Lab, that can trace its roots back to the 1960s. And that was a, a class in which students were assigned to a startup tech company, uh, frequently in the Boston area, but sometimes they would work, they do work in other places like Silicon Valley, and they would work one day a week was the goal on, with the company on a project, and the project had to be meaningful to the company, otherwise there was no point in doing it. So actual learning is, I think, um, a bit of a catch-all term. It means, and it has, we have lots of different courses with different versions of it. To me, it is get out of the classroom, do something different, and hopefully try and bring it back to the classroom and think about that in an, in an organized way way. Um, but I have a pretty ex expansive agenda, and I'll, and I'll tell you towards the end of the day some of the things we've done, including uh, recently, and trying to expand that and push it further. A any other questions on what is action learning? And I'll talk a bit about that when we get to further on as well. Yes, please. No, what's OJT? Uh, so, yeah, so, so, uh, so on-the-job training or, you know, there, there's many different t terms for that. It's closely related, right? And, and, so, and, and there are obviously some very long-standing successful courses, including engineering courses, which are partial release courses where you go and you work with a company for a prolonged period of time. Our own, uh, what's now called the L LGO program. Um, LGO. It was Leaders for Manufacturing. What, what's LGO stand for now? Leaders for Global Operations. Leaders for Global Operations. Um, they, they spend... Um, Six months. Six months with a company, right? I think so. Yes. So, that, so, that, so that's a very intensive internship. Typically, they do it uh, by themselves. Uh, in, so one student with one company or one project. A lot of the actual learning we've done is in teams. And we'll talk about that, why, why that works, particularly on, 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 the, on the team side, at least for what we do with the MBA classroom. Um, so, but I, but here, here's my warm-up question to you, which is, what do you remember from your education at MIT? Is, is there some part of it? You know, so this is kind of testing. What, what, do you remember theory? Do you remember something practical? Was it an internship? Was it the summer? Was it the uh, consumption functions <laughs> that have now been rebranded uh, community functions? I thought that was really clever. You keep the letter C. Anyway, they used to be, I remember, I was a graduate student at MIT in the 1980s. I remember when they were consumption functions, definitely. Uh, what do you remember from MIT? What, what, I mean, what is education? What sticks with you? When you go to a business school and you get a business education and then you go out and you, and you do something practical, as all of you have done, what, what is it that, what is it that, that, that you take away f from that experience? What I took away was the uh, group interaction, the forming of um, strategies and um, approaches, two or three people arguing together. Yeah, so group interaction. Two or three people. Make it three or four. <laughs> hey, you're talking. You're t these are my. This is my number. Four is my number. Four. Four. So global. The uh, global entrepreneurship lab, which which I helped to found with Richard Locke, uh, who is now who was just this week named provost of Brown University. So I think yeah, exactly. I think we can all claim and assist on that. And we should give Richard a round of applause because he's a big big reason we're all here today. Um, so. So one, one question we have, so this is the, the, the course that I've, I've run, founded with Richard, and, and run for 15 years, on and off. The two of us have run it for 15 years between us. Um, there was a question about, how, we're sending these teams of students to work around the world. What's a good team, what's a good team size? We tried, we tried everything. It's a very experimental approach. Honestly, I've tried, we've well, never done one, but two, three, five. The magic number for me, for MBAs working around the world in, in really challenging, difficult kind of situations is four. And I think 
that's because if you have five, you typically get a free rider. It's very hard to work on these kind of projects and have everybody lift equal weight with five. If it goes down to three, well, three sometimes does work, particularly when a fourth student drops out, you have to do three. But what can happen in three is that two will gang up against one. And that's not a good, I mean, and these are students who were sending to very far flung places. It's not easy to, I mean, and they're living intensively for three weeks in January in, in the G-Lab formulation, which we'll explain. So it's very hard to back away from that relationship when you're, so I think four is a good number, but two or three or four, group interactions, arguing with each other, figuring out how to do things in groups rather than individually. I think that, that's, a, that's an important part of the education here. What else, yes? Okay, so we certainly uh, like to hear that. So passion for learning and definitely beyond the classroom. So the idea, we're definitely not about the idea that the learning takes place only in the classroom. And, and again, in these um, global projects that we run, what the, what, the comp what the companies love is that the students figure out a lot about the company in advance and they show up and they work on the ground in January during IAP. And IAP, which used to be just a, time off um, to do different things has become a real strategic asset for us because no other university has that same block of time that people can commit after the fall semester before the spring semester. So in IAP, the, the students go and they figure out a lot about the company when they're on the ground and, and they figure out how to learn and then they, they help the company figure out how to learn as well when it's successful. It's just a great combination. Yes? Another thing that I remember from my graduate education as opposed to any kind of education that I got yep. before that is that I was feeling like I was think, thinking and talking about real problems, things that real, really did exist. I didn't go to GILA because I, don't in the, I was in the SDM program, but my husband did. But it, it, even though in those uh, classes, we were talking about actual problems on actual companies. And we were this really discussing, we were discussing things that were uh, actually discussed by the people who solved those things. So look, we, we, we would like to say uh, that we have real world problems in all of our classrooms, all of our discussions, absolutely. But on the other hand, I, so I was hired at MIT, I started teaching in 1996, I was hired on the faculty in 1997. They said, you should teach, we want you to teach global entrepreneurship. I said, that's great, fantastic, no problem. I had no idea what, what, what that, what I, you know, it was a job at MIT, what was I gonna say? Um, and and, and you know, at that time, I think there were seven or eight faculty you know, teaching, what, teaching uh, more or less full time around entrepreneurship, almost all of whom were focused on the US. So I said, that's great. I'll take the global mandate, everything else. But where was I going to get the material? Where was I going to get the real world problems? And, and uh, Pietro and other people are going to remember this. So, so what I decided to do, only, only because I was forced to do it, only because I had no alternative, um, otherwise my life would be destroyed, I, I went out to find, and, my, and my, my, uh, my friends and my early TAs and so on helped me find uh, entrepreneurs who were willing to become life, life case studies. So share sufficient detail. You know, it's a case study, but it walks and it talks and you can ask it questions, and you've got to get good at asking questions. That turns out to be something that, um, it's good to practice, at least, right? So you know, what are the right questions? What's a question that's, that, that's gonna help you learn what this company and, and, and what this idea is about? And, and, and from that came, um, the st students came and said, look, we like this course, we like this part of the real world where you bring them in the classroom, but we wanna go do projects. So the students are asking this, and, and, and this was a, a absolutely pivotal conversation in my life. It was with a couple of students and with Richard Locke, and I, I could show you the room where we had this conversation, except it's a construction site right now on the border between <laughs> E51 and E52. Um, and, and our initial reaction, so this was a couple of students, they were very good students, they were very articulate, they're very thoughtful, and they said, we want to do an internship, we want to be like eLab, this entrepreneurship internship, but we want it to be global. And our initial reaction was, you're crazy, we can't do it. But I, I learned something else from MIT students uh, working at MIT, which is, I'm not saying I always say yes, because I don't. Uh, don't get me wrong, and don't misquote me. But, but they often have, do have very good ideas, and particularly when they approach me in this organized way and thoughtful way, I, I've done very well when I've taken that seriously. So we tried to figure out how to make it work, and we decided that IAP was this time when students might be willing to go places and do global projects. And once we got our heads around that, and once we changed every MIT rule that existed, by the way, about when you could have a class and when a class would end and when you turn in grades because none of this was strictly permissible, but MIT is the kind of place they don't care. If it works and the students want to do it and it's a good learning experience, if you can justify that, they'll go for it. So that, that was exactly the beginning of the G-Lab, the Global Entrepreneurship Lab, which now has 
between 160 and 170 students a year take it. All sec the second years, uh, you have to be a second year because it runs through the fall and into, uh, into IAP. So I, I, I have no idea how long this will, will last. I, I keep thinking that interest will fade, people will move on, the world will change, maybe people won't want to travel. So far, it hasn't happened. So far, and, and the companies love it. The company, the record uh, is, I think one company's had seven. done this seven times. In a row. Seven years in a row. They pay. They pay the airfare and provide the local accommodation because my view is, our view is, you don't value things that are free. But it's not that expensive. If you're a startup in Brazil or Indonesia or Vietnam or South Africa, you're paying some money. You get these talented individuals. You get a team of four. They work hard during the fall to prepare, and they spend three weeks on the ground with you in January. That turns out to be a good combination as far as the projects are concerned and the students are concerned. The students will go anywhere in the world as long as it's not cold in January. I've also learned that. <laughs> we had some fantastic projects in Moscow. Oh, Siberia, absolutely. No, not, not interested. Nobody goes. It's all warm places in January. So it's the intersection of profound opportunities for learning and warm places in January, preferably <laughs> with access to a beach, but not necessarily. Not always a beach. It has to be warm. How do you measure after they come back the experience, the soft, certainly the soft, the soft interaction with the the employees in the company, thinking about how much permit the guys get into a company to solve the problem in the company in three weeks. Wait, did, did you retrieve some data from? We, we certainly try and get, we certainly get plenty of feedback from everyone involved. Um, we, we probably could do better in terms of systematically measuring. It is hard to measure. We spend a lot of time talking to the CEOs, and, and you know, the CEOs tell us what they got from it. And, and at that point, they don't have to be particularly nice to us, they already paid the money. And then we particularly spend time with the CEOs who, who work with us on a repeated basis. Because you learn how to do it. You learn how to work with a team and how to get value from a team. Um, we have now a CEO summit we hold every September or October, where we invite the CEOs from uh, companies that have projects now. But also we invite everybody who's been involved with this course. 25 to 45 CEOs come and talk about what's gone well, and they engage with their new team, and you know, they generally um, share that experience. Oh, we get a lot of, a lot of feedback from them. Look, I, I think when it, when it works well, and it, it works well a lot of the time, the, the students, um, by the time they hit the ground in January, because they spend a lot of time preparing, they are close to being in sync with the company. And when they spend the time on the ground in January, if they take it seriously, and they almost all do, they are thinking about the world in a, in a way, they are seeing the world through the eyes of that CEO. And I say to the CEOs, this is like rent a brain for a CEO. These are the, these are the people, um, these people will help you think about things that you want to think about, but you don't have time to do it because you're too busy with your day-to-day -day tasks. And if you trust them and you share the information and you get them sufficiently, I mean, you have to turn, that, their view of the world has to be turned around. It's not the view of, we're at MIT looking down and saying, okay, you should do this and that and the other. No, they have to be up, they have to be in the place looking up at the world saying, no, that doesn't look too good over here, but here's an opportunity which you might not have thought about. And that's really interesting. And that's a two-way learning process, I think, that Michelina will tell you a minute what she thinks, but I think that's a big part of, of, of why, why, why it's successful and why the companies keep coming back, because they don't have to come back. the group and the employees of the foreign company? So, uh, so I think there's two, well, two kinds of language barriers. Uh, the one is, do you speak the, the language, such as Portuguese? So, so uh, one, one thing we've also learned is nobody in the whole history of GLAB, which is 15. how many students so far? Uh, almost two, over 2,000. Over 2,000 people have taken GLAB. Nobody has ever gone to their own country. Which is okay for some languages, like Spanish. So there's plenty of Spanish language skills in the student population, and sp Spanish speaker from Spain will go to Argentina or vice versa. Portuguese can be a bit of a problem because no, because we don't have that many Portuguese students and Brazilian students. China. So we, at this point, we have a separate course called China India Lab that is similar to what I'm describing, slightly different format. Michelin can explain more, but it's focused on China and India. And there they have a partnership with a Chinese company, with Chinese universities. They, they work with Chinese students. Mm -hmm. And they do try and bridge the language gap partly in that way. Um, the, the other kind of language gap is the language as in culture gap. 
Do you, do you speak the language of the startup? Do you, do you understand, you know, do you approach this with sufficient humility? Do you understand and do you sound like, I mean, I, honestly, I say this to our students. I say, you, you know, you, you have to be careful when you come from MIT because people are a little inclined to think, oh, here come these rather smart, maybe slightly aloof uh, people who don't really understand what it's like to live where we live and to, to work through these problems. So I think that barrier, that, that can be a much bigger one. Uh, on the language, you know, a, a lot of these startups we work with or, or young companies, the language of management or the management speaks English. If you speak the local language, it's better. You can talk to more people in the company. You can go talk to customers without having to take a translator and you can get around by yourself, fend for yourself on the streets uh, in the evenings and so on without having to, to worry about it. But the companies take great, good, great care of the students too. So they do provide uh, translators uh, when, when, when that's needed. Yes, please. Fellow, uh, so came a little bit later than perhaps some other people in the room to Sloan. Uh, one of the things I found that Sloan taught me to do was to not just learn but to internalize what I was learning. And that comes back to the language or the ability to communicate. Because when I went back to my organization, which is a global nonprofit um, working largely in the developing world, nobody wanted to hear business speak. That was just not going to fly at all. Mm. So I need to internalize the concepts to such an extent that I could bring them down to a very uh, uh, parlance that people could accept and also internalize. Yeah, so you have to be able to communicate and you have to be able to use their language. Yeah. Otherwise, it sounds like you had some snooty business school ideas that were irrelevant to them. Exactly. So that's actually the problem that our GLAB students have to solve. Yeah. Exactly, which is, you know, I have some ideas. I think they're good ideas. But there's, a, there's either a cultural gap or there's a communication gap. And I need to make it, yeah. figure out how to get those absorbed and get people on my side. Right. Yeah, ab absolutely. I think that that's... That, that's, that's very common. The, 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 my latest uh, action learning, so the great thing about MIT, I always say to people is, uh, if you innovate, if you innovate and you're successful, you can you know, declare victory and, and you're a hero. And if it doesn't go well, you just stick it in the back of your office. I have a special filing cabinet for those things. And nobody ever mentions it again. We just took the Sloan Fellows, I just took the Sloan Fellows, accompanied them on a trip to Washington, DC, where we went, um, you know, then this was integrated into stuff we'd done during the year. We went to talk to policymakers and people around policy circles, and we talked to people across the spectrum, including the Business Roundtable, which is a you know, big group of CEOs, AFL-CIO, the leading trade union organization, and we tried to get them. We did engage with them on different um, their different perspectives on hot policy issues of the day, and. To me, it was, again, outside the classroom. They do, there's some fellows run the interaction. They have to ask the questions. The interaction is only as good as the questions they ask. They were very impressive to, to me and to, um, to the people we interacted with because they, they got it and, and they engaged with that. And I think that's a form of action learning, too. Please. I just want to join that. I was in uh, GLAB in Thailand. And uh, I could not only understand the language, but I couldn't even guess the reading, right? Because the alphabet is completely <laughs> different. It was the first time ever I was in a place where I was completely illiterate. So it was very interesting, but we were lucky enough that the company actually had a translator available for us. So for the more specifics of the like group meetings and all that, we could have the translator. And also all the people who spoke English at the office would help. And uh, you know, I think the cultural barrier is also a challenge, but it was uh, fascinating in many ways, like business-wise, culturally, learning. It was really an awesome experience. Did you have a good time? Well, yeah, it was very good. Was it warm in January? <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, okay. So that's it. That's what, it, that's what it's all about. And what, did you, what did you take away? I mean, if, you had to, if I had to put, pin you down on one thing to put up my board here from that experience. <laughs> well, uh, I'd say that's the, really the best way of learning is doing it. And the, the best like crash course I could have in, uh, in Thai culture and uh, their like, uh, entrepreneurial. So I, I, think, I think you actually see the world through this this particular um, course, or this particular kind of project, um, I think you see the world differently from the way you can see it. It's not the same as being a visiting business person. It's not the same as being a tourist, right? It, it's much more that you, you're, you're, you're seeing the world through their eyes, and you're helping them with a very concrete, specific problem. And I'll come back to this, turn the floor to Michelle in just a couple of minutes, but I'll come back to this um, towards the end, which is I think that there are not identical problems and not identical concepts, but very closely related problems and issues across young startup companies in particular and, and across entrepreneurs in many different places, including Thailand, including Brazil, including uh, some parts of the United States. Although once you get outside the United States, it gets a lot harder. And, that, and that's part of, I think, the, the shared experience here. Yeah. For people who put the group, do you select them to be successful on that? Or how 
So that's still still an issue we still an issue we grapple with. So, look, I like voluntary only. This is an elective. I would never do this as a required course, personally. I don't think it works. So you're you're, you're opting in, and you're going to go work intensively for the three weeks on the ground in Thailand or Brazil or whatever. You have to trust these people. You have to believe in them. Now we do have a case that we teach at the beginning of the the course every year, uh, based on on a on a, um, a on, on on a set of experiences actual experiences that happened called Breakdown in Brazil. And that's where a team of four had some terrible personal... Conflict. Yes, conflict is <laughs> putting it mildly. And then, but, so, so that's, and, and, it, and it's helped, it, we try to help the teams prepare and think ahead about what are, those, what are they getting themselves into? Can they handle the pressure? How are they going to handle disputes? Mm -hmm. How will they get, how will they recognize problems, get ahead of it? We do have mentors who work with all the teams. Again, we've learned that that's very important, who try to guide them through that, guide them through that uh, process. The breakdown in Brazil team, which had a lot of conflicts, um, ended up being very unhappy with each other. I don't think they ever spoke to each other again, but they delivered a fantastic work product. The, 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 as far as the company was concerned, they didn't know that these people were hating each other. So that, that to me, is a, is a tremendous experience. All right, let me turn to Michelina. Let me turn to Michelina. She's going to give a bit of structure on, on, okay. well, on, action, on, on action learning and some of these yep. other points, and I'll come back and do some brainstorming with you. Okay, perfect. So I'm going to go... Are you going to, you're helping me out here? <laughs> yeah. Um, so my background, I worked as a strategic management consulting consultant for a number of years. And uh, uh, I had the opportunity to do action learning in the corporate sector. So I worked with a number of large uh, Fortune 500 companies, uh, action learning, as well as in graduate school, I studied action learning. So I'm you know, uh, familiar with it uh, outside of higher education, but also understanding the pedagogy. So. Action learning has been around for a number of years. Uh, certainly, for those of you that might be familiar, Red Bevins uh, is the uh, considered the founder of action learning, this pedagogical approach to learning. And I would say that drawing from MIT's roots, so you know we're men's at manus, you know mind in hand, learning by doing. So drawing from that experience, our engineering tap roots as well, and the number of years that we've been doing this, uh, essentially where we are with what action learning means here at MIT Sloan is it's work on a real project and problems. We've talked a bit about that. And it's work on a real project or problem with actionable recommendations that leads an organization to action. It's a way of mutual, mutual learning. So we do uh, uh, quite a bit in making sure that the projects is enough of the projects that we get are enough of a stretch that it is um, uh, uh, it's, it's a little, it's a bit of a challenge for the students, but not so much of a stretch that it's uh, that they can't be successful. And certainly, we do look for companies that are partnering with us so that it's mutual, mutually beneficial. Um, action learning here at Sloan is a way of working with and through peers. So you had mentioned on someone mentioned on the job training, uh, different than an internship. What we are really looking for is students to not only uh, learn from the companies and the organizations they're working with, but learning to work together and learning to work from each other. Uh, learn, I'm sorry, learning from each other. Um, it is a means of personal and professional development. Uh, again, it's looking for them to develop their skills that will help them when they come back to campus as well as uh, what they do when they go off to their, uh, their next career. And um, it is a way of developing and advancing integrated problem framing skills that help organizations in complex environments move to action. So it's this idea of getting companies to make decisions to get them to move forward. And this is what the students look to do. And then finally, it's a way of learning from action through reflection. So we have points during the time that the students are working on their projects that they are reflecting. They're working before, during, uh, reflecting uh, before they begin, uh, while they are uh, in the project, as well as afterwards. Uh, and so in this way, we are looking to, uh, for students to fulfill the Sloan mission of uh, developing principal innovative leaders that impact the world. So, uh, so Simon is focused mostly talking about uh, G Lab in particular, but um, as many of you may know, we have a host of opportunities for students to participate in these electives here at Sloan. Currently, there are 16 labs, and again, these are all electives. They are open to the graduate students. Some of them are organized country, so we have China Lab and India Lab that Simon mentioned earlier. We also have organized, uh, our most recent is the A Lab, Analytics Lab, which is our big data lab. Um, and uh, for those students that don't feel that what we have is enough, 
Uh, there's also the study tours, which is also organized under our lab portfolio because the students will select a project uh, that they are particularly interested in. It could be water resource, it could be around uh, education, and um, they will design a course uh, with the support of a faculty and they will spend a semester working on that as well as going on site. So. Uh, these labs are, again, they're credit bearing. There's a course component uh, attached to it. And they, uh, some of them have a travel component and some of them do not. So uh, uh, again, lots of opportunities for students to, uh, to participate in these. And um, any questions about the labs, different labs? Yes? Sure, that's a great question. Within each individual lab, the, the faculty, to some extent, will do some work in terms of recruiting projects. Um, we also rely on alumni, uh, alumni from Sloan, as well as MIT alumni in general, who hear about the labs that will make suggestions for us. We also rely on word of mouth. Um, with, so with 16 different labs, um, that's about, that works out to be about 600 seats that are available for students to participate in labs here at Sloan. And that means that we're recruiting probably over 175 projects every year for all the, across the different labs. So it is a significant undertaking. Yes? You said it, but, uh, what are Lion teams? Lion teams, so Lion teams are part of the LGO uh, group and those are, the, those teams are part of um, the LGO program, they, their projects tend to have a focus, something around operations of some sort, and they, are part, they work with, uh, um, uh, with a Shanghai Zhatong University in China. So it, it is also organized similarly to the other labs as well. Okay. Yes? Um, the ratio of I think in the beginning, uh, the non-profit organization, the ratio going to a non-profit or a corporate. Mm. Uh, how so most of the projects that we work on tend to be uh, for profit. Uh, we did have, um, there was a lab that the, the faculty was, uh, has, was on sabbatical this past year, which was a Global Health Lab. Global Health was all non-profit, uh, and that was anywhere from, say, 12 to 14 uh, companies that they worked with. Uh, typically, uh, so healthcare lab may have some public, may have some health, may have some um, nonprofit, but for the most part, it's overwhelmingly uh, for profit. Yes, mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. Um, India Lab will sometimes pick up uh, a few nonprofit. I know that um, some faculty specifically look for a nonprofit uh, projects for students to work with as part of the portfolio that they're offering, but um, not not very often. I would say that, um, so we have some labs that are international, so all of their projects, so G-Lab, for example, is all international. Um, L-Lab, which is leading sustainable systems, is a mix, has some international, some domestic. Uh, it, it's hard to, to differentiate because some of the labs will have both. Um, some of them will just have international. Um, even within our international, we have, they may be trying to get into the U.S., so it's it's a, it's a complicated question. <laughs> yes. So, it, so yes, um, and so the so uh, entrepreneur um, uh, entrepreneurship lab uh, again works with startups. Global entrepreneurship labs tend to work with small to medium size uh, organizations, companies, um, and EM lab, which is enterprise management lab, tends to work with large companies. So we have a lot of a mix of different kinds of companies. For the students that have participated in MLab, it is not unusual for them to do a project in MLab and be given a job offer. So that would be your Googles, your Amazons. Um, again, they're working with, and these are the companies that the students, that they're looking to work with anyway, right? Um, in GLab, we tend to work with small to medium-sized um, businesses, and the students do get job offers, but because more often than not, they are not necessarily working in an industry that they want to be in long term, one. And two, uh, may not want to live in that country long term. It's just something that they were doing uh, just to, to expand their skill set or to explore uh, something new. So they do get offers. And um, more often than not, 
the students will continue to have some connection to the company, but it's more on an informal basis where they might either do some informal consulting or they might be a part of an advisory board, something like that. Great. Um, so I wanted to show this slide just to give you a sense as to the, the scope and scale of what happens here at Sloan. So um, Simon talked a bit about the origins, uh, you know, uh, action learning here at Sloan. Certainly I've talked with alums who said, no, you know, back in 1950-something, you, know, you know, I did something similar to this. Um, so certainly, you know, drawing from our engineering roots, you know, we do have some, uh, th this notion of experiential goes back a long way here at Sloan. But um, again, kind of our, our modern manifestation of what this experiential learning looks like has come through eLab, Entrepreneurship Lab, and then G-Lab, which, which started in uh, 2000, and then you know, really just blossoming from there, where today we have our, our 16 different labs. So, um, so we kind of look at it as in the modern sense. You know, we've had 23 years of action learning. Number of countries, not surprisingly, has been, we're at 68 uh, countries where we've had projects over the last 20 plus years. Uh, translates into about a, more than a thousand projects. We've had over 5,000 students that have participated in labs since 2000. And as we mentioned earlier, about 2,000 of those are in G Lab, which is a global entrepreneurship lab, Simon. 80% uh, of the students will participate in at least one lab. Uh, so I always say that you have to actually go out of your way not to participate in a lab here at Sloan because it's, it's so prevalent. 80% um, will participate in one. 60% uh, will do two or more labs. And we have some students that will do five, which means that what they're doing is two labs in a semester. They'll do one that has a travel component and one that does not have a travel component. And they do them at the same time. It's a lot of work because we do tell the students to estimate between you know eight and twelve hours that they'll participate in the labs, and um, but for some students they said you know this is the way that I you know this is the way I learn best so I would love to take labs and uh, a few of those students have affectionately referred to themselves as lab rats, so. <laughs> um, so you know, of course, at that scale, as you can imagine, there are a lot of faculty that are involved in uh, in the labs. So. 45 faculty, some of that is kind of a double count because we do have some of our, there's, um, there are senior lecture, there are uh, tenured faculty that are associated with all of the labs. However, they rely on senior lecturers. These are folks that have deep industry experience to support the labs as well, and they serve as mentors, which Simon mentioned earlier. These are folks that work with the teams to help them translate the theory to practice, um, ta uh, using their, 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 their networks, their life experiences, uh, their connections, but helping them make that, uh, make that connection. So again, uh, lots of support. G-Lab, for example, has, uh, last year we had uh, 10 senior lecturers that were involved in the lab, supporting the lab as well as several administrative assistants, two TAs, and the Action Learning Office that helped to manage uh, that particular lab. Um, and as I showed, uh, we had 16 labs. Those are very much driven by faculty interest and willingness to run a lab, as well as student interest. And that's how we've gotten to our number of 16. So I will, uh, any questions about the labs in general? Okay. Um, so do you want to talk a bit about the success, our success stories in G-Lab? Um, you, you mentioned a couple of success stories. I want to turn it into where do we, where do we go next? Sure. So um, this is just a highlight and just really to, to give a sense for G-Lab specifically, uh, you know, where we've been. Uh, Connexia, you know, Simon had talked about the, number, the companies that we've worked with over a number of years. Connexia is one that we've worked with uh, four or five times in a row, and actually have one of the cases that we use in G Lab is connected with uh, with Connexia, and this also gives a bit of a range to show that we've worked with uh, our um, the PTT, which is uh, helping to benefit Thai um, coffee shops to benefit Thai farmers. Uh, one of the ones that we are, I think, particularly proud of is Inco Education, and that project. Uh, that company grew out of a G-Lab team that worked with the company uh, in South Africa. And they were, this CEO wanted to figure out how could I possibly uh, start uh, 
you know, um, develop a, a school for middle income uh, uh, African families. So the students, the, the, the families will have a different option than the, you know, high priced education and, you know, what the, the state was offering. And um, the students working with this uh, individual, the CEO, who's a VC, very successful VC in South Africa, uh, came up with this idea of creating uh, an educational program, and the student, when he graduated from Sloan, went back, had kept in contact with the CEO, went back to South Africa, and they started Inco Education, which uh, my understanding is is, uh, is very successful. So, yes. How many sources and companies that uh, welcome the students worldwide? So uh, a few different ways. Um, for G Lab in particular, uh, we have a faculty who has an extensive role of desk and uh, she goes out and does a lot of uh, uh, a lot of the recruiting. Um, we also have some really great partnerships, uh, Simon as well as Sherry Losberg who helps us with the recruiting, uh, works with Endeavor, very closely with Endeavor Global. And through their program, we are able to, they're able to uh, refer uh, potential uh, companies to us. Uh, because they, they tend to be a good fit for us. So a lot of the companies that we work with in Latin America tend to be from Endeavor. Um, and then again, we also do word of mouth. Um, Simon talked about the companies that we have uh, tend to be warm places. Um, for whatever reason, we get projects from Serbia uh, every year. And though we've not done any recruiting, we never do any recruiting in Serbia, uh, every year we have a few that get taken up in the labs uh, because they uh, have found us and uh, they uh, have joined uh, and submitted, and so they will have a compelling project that gets taken up in the labs. So. What would consider a good project and a good uh, company to work with? Sure. So the the, the tricky part about that uh, is depending on which lab you're speaking of, uh, the requirements of the lab and what they're looking for in terms of their learning objectives are slightly different. So for G Lab, uh, small to medium sized enterprise, uh, we're looking for a company that's at a at an inflection point in their growth. They have you know, good revenue. We don't want to have more Sloan students than actual people at the company. So there are lots of ways that we you know, think about that. Whereas with some of the other companies, um, you know, like GoLab, for example, the, the objective of their course is um, uh, horizontal, horizontal vertical integration issues. So they're looking for something completely different. So certainly, if you have any ideas of companies that you think would be a good fit, um, you know, letting us know. Uh, and then we can work and figure out what might be the best fit in terms of lab. But there's 16 different labs. I always say that no matter what, we can find a fit with, within one of the labs if you have a good company. Yes? Just to have an example, I hosted a group from Gillette. Oh. Uh, sure. So, and say more, say more about the. Yeah, so, so uh, in terms of the process, uh, I knew about the program and I knew the people who were doing it while I was here. So I uh, got in touch with Sherry. Sherry, Sherry Lewis work, yeah. And uh, we have a document to apply. So you, you talk about the company, the project you want to do. And from what I understand, I'm not sure if it's, uh, that's the right way they do, but they uh, they show this to students as students decide which one they want to work on. Right. Right? So mm -hmm. My company is in Brazil, which helps. It's one Absolutely. <laughs> we have a it's company in Brazil, part. if that's what we want. <laughs> And, so, and, and can, would you mind sharing a bit about your experience working with the, the team? Yeah, so it was, it was very interesting. I mean, uh, it was a very smart group. And uh, I think what they helped us more was asking questions. We are a, not a very common company to, to receive MBAs. We are in the advertising agency. Uh, but it was uh, very interesting. They, they did a project on uh, evaluating the uh, presence of uh, brands in social networks, which was, was interesting. I think they like it. They like it. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Fantastic. Well, so we, we always have lots of great stories about, you know, the, the, the teams and, um, you know, the, the kinds of things that, that they get into. And so certainly coming out of their experience working on the labs, you know, when I talk with companies, they say, oh, you know, yeah, we, we know the students would do a good job. You know, we weren't concerned about that at all. Um, and even when the students, you know, we talk about Breakdown Brazil, even when they are having some interpersonal conflicts. Uh, more often than not, they rise to the occasion and it's completely transparent. 
um, to the to the companies, and so uh, they, they, the feedback that we get, um, whether it be uh, personally when I go out to the companies and talk with them, or the, the evaluations that they send back, um, overwhelmingly, it's it's very positive. But one of the things that they tend to focus on is talking about the residual effects of the company, or the, the residual effects um, for the company of the students having been there. The um, the, the, the students have a significant impact. They are overwhelmingly gracious, they are kind, they um, extend themselves to meeting everyone within the organization. Um, they uh, uh, you know, really truly try to think about the, the mutual learning aspect of this experience. So you know, we're bringing uh, what, our knowledge and our insight to you and you know, we wanna learn from you as well. And so, uh, you know, we try to instill that before they go out and they're on site, but certainly when we hear that feedback, um, that, that's, that's great news for us. I've done a good job with them. Yes. Okay, anyone else? Yes? Out of Southern Poetry or something, um, the, how many uh, institutions or organizations use the recommendation from this action learning outcome? So the, it's hard to say, to answer that question, only because there are many different labs. And so each one of them, in terms of how they're tracking their recommendations, is very different. And one of the things that we found is, um, uh, I think this was uh, Connexia, and this happens, it's not unusual, where the students will make recommendations, it kind of gets shelved, and then they come back to it a few years later and said, you know, you, 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 said, you talked about this, we weren't ready at the time, but now we'll come back you know, several years later and do that. We do really insist that the students' recommendations are actionable, um, so it's not a nice coffee table book that's really meant to be something that the uh, that this, that can be used immediately. So, um, you know, the, the 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 most recent evaluations that we did for G Lab, um, most uh, I'm going to say of the folks that completed the um, the evaluation, most of that they were looking to implement within six months. Yes. I want I, I, and I, so I say most because I think that there were one or two that they weren't sure, but other than that, the, the rest of them said yes. Um, and actually, uh, because we insist that it's actionable, that it's something that can be used immediately, um, oftentimes they say, "Well, we're it, we've been implementing it. You know, it's been we're doing this in real time." Um, we had uh, one of our teams this past year. The students helped them launch a new project. So the the so the students left in end of January. And by March, they were announcing this new product line that got um, a big uh, preview at, um, at uh, South by Southwest in April. So it happened that, that quickly. So always, always very exciting for us to see that. Yes? From the point of view of the professor, what's the challenge in teaching a course like this? So Simon's been doing this for the, last, for the last 15 years. Do you want to speak to the challenges of, of teaching this course? I, yes. I, I, I have my ideas. Yeah, so it is a challenge. I'm glad you brought, used the word challenge. Mention <laughs> that to the dean when you see him. Uh, you know, it, it's very, it, it's really, once you've been doing teaching MBA classrooms for a while, it's quite straightforward to come in and present a case and have a discussion and get across a few analytic points. It's a very controlled environment. And, and I, you know, you've heard a lot of the discussion before, and you can guide that discussion. This is you know, every day something different. I mean, we are disappointed when uh, our, project, our, our recommendations are not implemented. I mean, that's the goal, make it happen. But between here, and, and, and it typically is, but between here and there, there's all kinds of things that go wrong. You know, we've had um, companies go out of business, we've had um, wars break out, we've had bombings, we've had uh, mm -hmm. terrible um, illnesses on both sides of this. I mean, there's just a lot of things that happen when you get outside the classroom. Um, and we're trying to make sure that all the students have a good experience, absolutely, mm -hmm. without exception. And it is very hard to make, I mean, actually, and, and I think for 80% of the students, it's quite straightforward, and they're very self-organizing and so on, and that's part of the beauty of this. But there are some students who, for whom this is, this is a stretch, uh, honestly, mm -hmm. and we, work, we spend a lot of time with those students. Um, and, and, and I could save myself a lot of trouble just by keeping it inside the classroom. Mm -hmm. But I think it will be less, less good uh, as, as a learning. Um, so because no, you don't say that to the dean. <laughs> <laughs> so, so this is an interesting point. So MIT, MIT has, a, has a strong view compared to some other schools that you should have uh, a tenure track or tenured professor involved with all of these activities. Oh, no. and, and, and part of that is to make sure that from a pedagogical learning point of view, it makes sense. 
Uh, I'm not saying other people couldn't do that, but that's a MIT principle. And I think that's actually served us well. However, I have to emphasize, and Michelin has already mentioned, it's a big team that makes this happen. So this coming year, Michelin and I will share the classroom pieces. A lot of this happens outside the classroom. We're going to have 10 or more mentors. 12, I think. We're hoping to have 12 mentors. Um, we're always in the market for mentors. We're going to make our pitch to <laughs> you in a minute for that. Um, we, we, we've got uh, plenty of uh, logistics support people. We have a lot of people. Um, we have Sherry Lesberg, who does a fantastic job on recruiting the projects and helping to screen them. So it, it's, it's, a, it's a very strong team that makes this happen. And I think the professor is a useful person, mm -hmm. member of that team, but I wouldn't want to exaggerate my usefulness mm -hmm. either. Right. Okay. OK, I did have the original idea, too. I've got to get some credit for that. <laughs> but apart from that, actually, the students, sorry, the students had the original idea. I was just smart enough not to, to ignore them. To execute. OK, let's be clear. <laughs> so just to, to add on to that, um, uh, all of the courses have, uh, a fac have the you know, tenure faculty. And part of what they give to the students is the tools to help them Think about the approach. So sh we we do have these uh, senior lecturers that have you know great industry experience, um, but also in terms of thinking about an approach, thinking about you know um, macro level issues. Um, that's where the faculty come in as well as teaching them uh, tools. Uh, um, L Lab, which is leading sustainable systems, Peter Sange teaches uh, tools about leadership that the students are working with themselves to think about their own leadership capabilities, as well as with the companies that they're working with. So it's you know uh, doing it in real time for themselves and with the companies. So that's the, that's the important role of the of the, the faculty as well. Yes. So I actually took LLAB. I was class of 2014, so to go PhD. There you go. <laughs> um, and that actually was the most valuable part of the actual learning experience for LLAB was the skills. And in my discussions with my classmates who took GLAB or SLAB, I took SLAB as well, but the soft skills of dealing with multiple uh, groups and, and uh, multiple stakeholders and learning how to communicate more effectively. Uh, over the past year since I graduated, that's been the most valuable part of the skills I learned. And employing them not only in practice in the classroom, but or practicing in the classroom, but actually doing it with an actual company in a project, um, that was really, really valuable. And I was wondering if that's something that is also uh, taught uh, and practice in other action learning labs outside of LLAB? Yes, yes. Um, you know, we, we, we spend a lot of time and attention. Um, while the students, I think, are quick to dismiss the soft skills, you know, we need rigor, we need, you know, we need data, we need to do analysis. Um, more often than not, what will blow up a great working team is the interpersonal skills. And it's the ability to not only work within their team as team, the other three people I'm working with, but it's also being able to work well with the companies that they're that they're connected with. So um, we do spend a lot of time and attention getting them to think about that. We have our, our breakdown in Brazil case, which talks about kind of a dysfunctional uh, um, G Lab team and um, getting students to have those conversations early um, and getting them to think about how do we make decisions in each other's absences? Um, how do I think about my own uh, ability to to work with my peers, uh, um, uh, influence the group, um, negotiate you know my needs within this group. So all of that stuff does get incorporated in the in the, in the labs, and um, you know the, the the different labs will pay attention to it in different ways in terms of their approach. But um, um, very important, very important. Yes. Uh, so for the students in G-Lab, when they're on site, uh, we do ask, they are off kind of left to on their own, um, but we do have them have check-ins with the um, with their, their mentors. So the, the senior lecturers that they're working with, they're supposed to be checking in regularly. So at least once a week, but certainly uh, more frequently and necessary. Um, historically, um, between myself and maybe folks from, say, admissions or the MBA program office, we'll be out in the world traveling for other things, and we will meet up with those teams when they're on site. And having that connection, that just kind of touching base again, sometimes is very helpful. Um, you know, I, I did an intervention with the team in the in the Phil we went the only veg vegan reg vegetarian restaurant um, in Manila, and we kind of commandeered the space to have a, a bit of a. a, a you know, to, to talk about interpersonal skills um, and how they could work together better. Um, and so sometimes that's effective on site to have those touch points. But overall, 
the students are kind of left on their own. And a lot of that is very intentional because unlike some other so unlike some other schools, um, we do look for the students to own the relationship with the host company. Um, the, 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 the senior lecturers, the faculty, everybody, we are absolutely 100% supporting the students, but it's very much in the background uh, because the students should be the face of the work with the company, not not the fact, so it's not like the grown-up that's in the room that's going to you know, swoop in and fix everything, but it's really put on the students. and. Um, uh, you know, with some other programs, uh, even in, in that, the way that that's organized, it's a significant expense for the school. I mean, that this is, you know, not only resources in terms of, of faculty and, you know, other senior lecturers, but certainly with all the, uh, the infrastructure that's required for us to support, it's a lot of work. That additional cost of sending faculty out as well, we're not, we're not quite there yet, so we'll, you know, maybe do some fundraising so that we can get there. But um, you know, it's a significant expense. And um, so we do try to prepare them for that um, when they're on site. But, um, but they, are, they are left kind of on their own. Yes? Uh, the learning for students, uh, I guess, would be tangible and intangible, right? Uh, so I was wondering whether you try to quantify the intangibles. Try to quantify the intangibles. Um, I wouldn't say. Only at MIT could you ask the question. <laughs> <laughs> um, so quantify, mm, that's, it's hard. Um, one of the things that we're trying to take a look at, for example, is um, better understanding the impact. So that, so, um, I'm sorry, your name is? Alex. Alex. So Alex can say, you know, I graduated a year ago, and I'm still using the skills that, uh, and what I learned in LLAB you know, which would have been more than a year ago. Um, and so we are trying to do a better job in terms of capturing that. And, and even for the folks who say, you know, I did G-Lab three years ago, and it something about that experience just clicked for me. So even in terms of thinking about the time horizon is very is very difficult. And with some of the companies, someone had asked about how do we capture our um, capture impact. It's hard to think about how we measure that because so many other there's so many other variables and so many other things happening that they're implementing at the same time that it's hard to kind of isolate you know what the students have done. So we are trying to do better jobs in terms of capturing that. But right now we are mostly capturing uh, uh, qualitative um, insights from these uh, from the students' experiences, and um, you know we're uh, making a huge investment right now in. Um, uh, IT in our infrastructure, um, so that we can get more at that. But we aren't we aren't there yet. So, I'll turn. So I'll turn over to Simon. Okay. Then. So can we just put the, the slides back on the side one and put yep. that screen okay. up? So I want to I want to try and take the last half hour and talk with you about uh, where where we go from here. And I, I really wanted to try and, and brainstorm. So we've done a lot. I mean, I think if you if, if you have a project or an idea, um, we have a lab to match it. That's what Michelin has said. Um, <laughs> But, but I, I think specifically I'm interested in this global piece <coughs> and you know, the issue of where in the world we can be, what we should be working on, and, and, and where the next frontier is. And I, I, I just want to have your thoughts now, and I want to um, you know, encourage you to, to write to me or Mitch Slade or talk to us in the reception next or write to us afterwards. I mean, so the sweet spot for this, just to recap and summarize what we've been talking about, we're looking for startups, we're looking for global, non-US, I, I would say in terms of number of employees, it's between 20 and 250. We'll take on people who, who work in garages, but they've got to be big enough garages. You know what I mean? So th there's a bit of infrastructure. There's been some success that they, they often have a, a question about expansion. It could be a strategy question. It could be an organization question. We, take, we do take on some technical questions, but only if it's very much management related, like how are we going to organize our information technology? So there has to be a management component. We're not doing programming for people. But, the, but we're happy to take on technology related tasks. As you know, that's one, one of the great strengths of our students. They're all into technology one way, one way or another. Now, we have done a lot of this in Latin America. Um, I think we've worked almost everywhere in Latin America, perhaps not Bolivia, perhaps not Paraguay, but almost everywhere else we've had great mm -hmm. success. We, we do a lot in Southeast Asia. Um, and I, I, we've also done Philippines. 
not always yeah. called Southeast yeah. Asia. Um, India and China is, is a separate, just, it, that just because it's so big and, it's, and there's a lot of interest, it's that's gone lab. into a separate structure. Um, and we have done some in Africa. Mostly South Africa. Yeah, Africa has Africa been relatively hard for us. I mean, what we find is that students are willing to, we do try to tell the students this is, it's like going camping, which kind of works for some people, not others. Um, but um, outside of, you know, we've done projects in Tanzania, we've done projects in Kenya, we've done Ghana, we've done um, South Africa. Guinea, Conakry. Creek. South Africa is, is, has gone well, but other, other places it's yeah. been tough. I mean, I think, I think what, this works when there's a, a common, when there's a structure that they're actually very familiar with, there's a CEO, and the CEO has, is part of a team, Probably the, the global companies that we encounter are a little bit, have a stronger individual at the, at the core rather than it being three or four founders. But there's definitely other people involved in, in the founding. Um, they absolutely have raised some capital. It's not typically the venture capital that you experience in the United States. It's something a little that you would regard from your perspective as being a little quirky. But this capital that's come in from the outside could be, could be fr fa family and friends. It could have come from the, the, the founding team. Um, and, and they typically also have a set of mentors or advisors, people who are helping them, open doors and so on. That's a big part of what Endeavor does really successfully. Endeavor started in um, Argentina and Chile when we were starting GLab. They've now spread globally. So these, and they want to make money. I mean, this, this is actually, may sound a little crass, but there, there's a simplifying uh, imperative to wanting to make money. So we've worked a lot, we've tried a lot to, with nonprofits. I've tried nonprofits in the global, um, in the GLAB structure. I've tried, tried nonprofits. We had a partnership with the World Bank that, that was brief, but we tried hard. We have, uh, Anjali Shastri has had a lot of success with his global health mm -hmm. projects, which are trying to solve business problems related to health in low income places. And, and I like those. They are, those are tough problems. Um, in part because nonprofits have a lot of different objectives. And you don't always know what you're getting into. And it's often very hard to scale those. The, the, if you can figure out how do I, I'm making some money. I've been able to build my company to 20 to 40 to 60 people. I want to go to the next stage. And I have some ideas about what that's going to involve. I want you to come check out my ideas. So you go, you check out the ideas. And you either confirm that those are the right ideas. Or you actually, this often, often happens. I think this is one of my favorite impacts, which is the students figure out that it's not the right idea, what the CEO has. So then they have to figure out. Okay, how do, we how do we tell them it's not the right idea? And how do we propose what we think is a better alternative, but do that in a non, not a, not, hey, we're the MIT, guys from MIT, we just figured out that you're, you've got it wrong. That's not gonna go across very well, right? They have, to, that's a, they have to figure out how to communicate it. They have to become very credible in the eyes of the CEO, and they have to persuade them to change, to change course. And that's been some of our most successful projects when that actually happens. What, I think, what we should do, can we do it? Those are the two different questions. And the organizations, sometimes they know what to do, but sometimes they cannot do it. And then what's it? But even though they say what well, we cannot do it, but if they, are, they may be able to, based on the change of cultural or... Yeah, so, 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 so what's, what's the way for students to persuade management to... Well, uh, look, the, the, student, the students have to be very credible. They have to, you, the management has to really believe that these students, they know, they know the market, they know the company, they know the people, and hopefully they bring some broader perspective as well, which may not be readily available in, in, this, um, in, in, in the company or the, the, something, things the CEO doesn't know. A and they have to be um, convincing. They have, they have to know the details. They have to be able to think about the practical aspects. It's not, you can't say, uh, well, good idea in, th in practice, but it won't work in theory, right? Mm -hmm. that, doesn't, that doesn't work with these CEOs. It has to be very concrete, and you have to address the issue of what do we believe your company can do? What are your capabilities? What have you actually shown you can do? Mm -hmm. And it has to be extremely, extremely concrete. Right. And, and this, is, this is also why, so we, to, to just elaborate on one of Michelin's answers, we don't, by the time you're on the ground in January, it's too late. I, the, the, I think basically that we know, you know, that it's very hard to have an intervention. We save those for the emergency type situations. 
But we spend a lot of time with the students ahead of, before they go, in the mentoring, in the back and forth. Have you, understood, have you understood what you're getting into? Have you learned what you can? Are you bringing what you can to the table? So that's really important, and I think that's a very big part of what the teaching team does, not just the professor, but that's what the mentors, mm -hmm. senior lecturers do. Yeah. yeah. I have a question. Peter Sengen, when I graduated in 95, that's the time he started to talk about organizational learning, and mm -hmm. how does, like, five disciplines the book he wrote, and then how from there, I'm not catching up anymore for Peter Sengen, but how is he impacting to teach this kind of organizational change um, to be effective way? Uh, so how Peter Sengen from? So, yeah, Alex may have a good how answer. That was so for Peter. Yeah. And then what, what portion of what? Do you want to take that off? Sure. Yeah, so what, 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 where, where, uh, I mean, I think the, this question is in two parts. One for you, which is, you know, what, what is Peter Senge's contribution in terms of, you know, what you learned uh, about uh, change within organizations? And then there's another part about what we use in other courses. I'll deal with that. So the change within organizations, I'd say that the most valuable part was learning how to be an agent of change. Um, learning how to be an agent of change within agent organizations. Change. Okay. So when you come into a new organization, uh, a uh, couple of things of check-ins and, and uh, understanding how to communicate and listen more effectively, especially when, when you want to understand how to change the conversation. Um, so uh, you mentioned influence and influencing people within organizations to drive new change. It, one big thing Peter talks about is uh, learning how to communicate a, a shared vision of how things can be different and getting people to buy in on how this different is not a threat to them, but it's actually better, it's better for everybody. Uh, so learning how to communicate that and have like, we practiced uh, different roles in communication because different people have different uh, tendencies in, in conversation. Some are more defensive, some are more offensive, some are quieter, some agree with everybody. Um, so we did a lot of role playing to practice so that when you actually are in a situation, you're gonna say, oh, okay, I know how to, communicate more effectively with this type of communicator. Um, and that's all about thinking about how you want to drive change within an organization. Uh, leadership at L Lab is about uh, incorporating things like sustainability um, and things that are becoming very popular, but still traditional organizations resist it because they see it as change that they don't know. Yeah, so I would say a lot of these ideas are, are, are actually spread throughout our curriculum now. I think L Lab's a great course. Uh, and I'm sure it adds a lot of value, but I, I, I hear a lot of similar ideas coming from, from students who come into GLab. So GLab is a course in which you're applying what you've learned elsewhere, and you're using your tools, and you're developing your tools. And if you have gaps in, in your toolkit, that's something that we try and identify. And with the students on, on a voluntary basis, we try and make sure they know how to work in this kind of you know, consulting environment, this kind of change environment. Um, and and you know, it's not that everybody needs the same tools from us because they're coming to us in the second year. A lot of them have many or perhaps they have all of the tools they need. Um, but we do try and tailor it appropriately. Um, OK, so, so I'm looking for pro so it's profit companies outside the US. Those are the areas that we've and had some success. And the Middle East. We've had a few. We've, we, we've always had lots of interest from the Middle East. We ha are very sensitive to events that happen between Labor Day. So we, we, we get the projects at the beginning of September, we send the students in January. You know, we have to be aware of things that may discourage the students from traveling or may make it harder to travel in that period. And so the, and the student interest in the Middle East has always been, I think, there, but limited. Yeah, yeah fair. Um, so so uh, thoughts about where we could or should take this in terms of sectors, places, ideas, I mean, if it, if it works in the GLab context, I'll take it. If not, I'll pass it on to someone else. Yeah, Alex. So I think uh, for me, the most interesting space right now is uh, food, food systems and agriculture. Um, and it's, we talk about startups, the fastest growing area in terms of investments uh, from VCs and, and Silicon Valley is in food and ag tech. Um, and it's something that I, I think uh, MIT has the, the resources to really add value in the space and be a leader in supporting uh, startups in that space. 
So we, we have done a little bit of that. We've had we had a project on sustainable uh, fish last in the last cycle. Last two years. Last two years we've done sustainable fish. Um, but if you have, I, I like this, it, and, and so we, and those were in Chile. Those are both in Chile. Chile. Mm -hmm. So if you, I, I like this, if you have ideas about places, food system. I, I also have a, a good friend who does this in in Nova Scotia, but not so warm in, in January, right? So you understand the constraints. <laughs> to, to give, send us, I like this, send, send ideas. And places where, places where venture capital is starting to get interested in the United States, that's actually a good leading indicator we found in general of, of, of lo lots of pieces um, of, of this around the world. Yes? Mm -hmm. You have a great opportunity inside the school. All that knowledge that all the students are coming back from that experience, from, from, from international behavior or leadership, I mean, I think there is a huge opportunity there that may, maybe you are not quantifying or looking that can help to improve a lot of the different labs that are around the school. Uh, it's silly that maybe more we should do, and, and that's absolutely on, on our collective agenda. I tell you this though about I tell you this about MIT students. They 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 prepare well, they go and do a fantastic job in January. They come back and we have a big global debrief session. We run a terrific poster session down and we take over the entire cafeteria for half a day downstairs. And then they're done. Getting them to talk, we, I used to run, we've tried different versions of this course. One version was have a half semester after you've come back, sharing what you learned, where you learned it, and, and sort of a, a, a deep reflection. It was the most painful thing I've ever done, honestly. Mm -hmm. They did not want to reflect at all. I mean, we have this discussion a lot. Right. Michelena is more of a pro-reflection person than I am uh, in general, uh, in philosophy. Yes. But, but I, I, partly that's, I, I just find that the, the students want to move on. I mean, you're action-oriented mm -hmm. people. You want to have action. You want to have impact. It, I've been there. I've done that. I do tell them, I do tell them don't accept a job offer. You know, make sure you come back and have a cooling off period because they fall in love with the project and the CEO. But then they're done. They move on. And, and, and the problem is also they graduate because this is all second. G Lab is all second years. Now mm -hmm. it's a little bit, um, it, it, some of these other labs, including the India China Lab, have first years and second years. And that's really good because you get a, a learning inside the Sloan community. So people who do India China Lab in the first year, then in the second year they come and take G Lab and they've already had that experience. And so there's a lot more sharing. You know, I, I would like to have more reflection and more sharing. So the students want to move on. So, I, I used to work for a company that I think that company grew a lot based on, on merits and acquisitions. And every time we, we finish doing a Judaism, we bring all the team back. Mm -hmm. And start getting debriefing what, what, what were the problems they were facing from the, the cultural point of view of communication. And then for a specific topics of on, on, on marketing, on operations, everything. So we were building a, a complete database that for the next team that were approaching uh, and, and new position, they were looking at specific things and, and it was so easy to, to handle that. So let me just add to, just to, to, uh, to talk. So when the, the students go off, they do their, their three weeks on site in January, they come back. We have a large kind of reconvening of the group and we do like a large uh, reflection and then they will break up into smaller groups to continue that, um, that reflective session. They have between blogs and various papers that they write that we capture their insights. You know, um, they're asked to identify learning objectives at the beginning of the course and then they're reflecting on them throughout the, the time that they are within G Lab, but then certainly when they come back, they're asked to kind of tack back and, you know, what were your learning objectives and how do you think about that now? So we do do those kinds of things. In addition to that, we have student surveys that we collect the information. Um, I, there are like five different surveys that we'll have for the students to co get that kind of information from logistics. You know, what, um, what was your lodging like and was that a good experience and what should we know about that to, can you tell us about, you know, what it was like working with this company? What did you get from that experience? And, you know, in terms of the way that they, say, implemented your recommendations or what they thought about what your final product was, you know, give us all that information. And then in addition to that, um, I will go out and, um, and Simon does as well, we'll meet, I think you met with every team, right? Or most of the teams. Well, most of the teams. Right. Um, and just ask them to come in and let's hear your feedback. The individual faculty mentors as well will, uh, outside of, um, you know, once the course is over, maybe a month or two afterwards, we'll invite them to come over. You know, let's, you know, talk about your experience. And from all of that, we get notes and, and, and ideas, and we have a session where we go back and talk and say, here's what we heard from the different students, and that helps us think about G Lab going forward. I, I look, I think it's a great idea, and I'm, you, I, I will, you'll force me to think more about it. 
But, but in the co- difference between the company setting and the school setting is the, the, the students move on. In your company, most of the people are still around there. And you have, so you know, even if they don't work on the next deal, they're available to, be, to talk about it and to fill in the gaps and to explain what actually happened. So it's, it's tough, but we, we, should, we, should, we, do, we should do more. Yes? And I just wonder if the uh, T Lab uh, is you know, actively involved in that sector. I try to find a project here to kind of establish a link um, from that industry, insurance actually. And uh, it's all about digitalization right now uh, of, and transformation of business models. Could you share a little bit what you have done there maybe or what you plan for? Yeah, so, so financial services is, is an important uh, sector for us. We have done some in, in the past. I mean, we tend to be working with startups, right? Um, so in financial, so and, and I think uh, the blockchain, so bit, Bitcoin related technology, the blockchain, there's a project at the Media Lab that I'm engaged with. I think that's got a lot of potential for us because this is where we start to see more of these startup companies, for example, in the US. I expect we're going to see more of that outside the US too. The problem is that a lot of financial services, as you know, in many places are very big companies and, and the challenges the startups are not so much. We have done um, stock brokerages, for example, and we've done uh, venture capital. And we've done some of the pieces, some, some, you know, I wouldn't call it core banking services, but we've done some pieces around that. To the extent there are new up and coming companies, that's the sweet spot of, of, of GLAB. You know, we have a very strong finance faculty, obviously, and we have other finance yes. offerings that plug into the more, the bigger, mm-hmm. the bigger companies. So that's a little bit not what we work on in this, in this, in this context. But I, I, yeah, I like that globally, and I like the blockchain in terms of new alternative ways to make payments and to, um, have security over data and to have security over transactions, the recording of transactions. I think there's a huge amount of potential there. And I think that I, actually, I personally see more opportunities for that outside the United States sometimes than I do inside the United States. So I'm hoping that will plug very much into this. And, and I hope our Media Lab team will, will help us attract people and ideas from around, around the world. Yes, Tor. John Sturman. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. And it was very interesting. So companies working on renewable energy, mm-hmm. reduction of CO2 emissions, etc., seems to be very important mm-hmm. on the global scale. Yeah. yeah. And, oh, oh, those tend to go to the other. Yeah, so we did we have the sustainability, big sustainability initiative and this and the sustainability lab that's focused a lot mm-hmm. on that. And so they've tend to tend to take those projects. Mm-hmm. Um, but yes, it, absolutely it's a it's a very very good growth area. Yes, mm-hmm. at the back. Yeah, your comment about the uh, blockchain kind of alluded to this, but uh, software and cloud technology, there's such a dominance of, of the US in that space in Silicon Valley. Uh, you know, with software maybe there's uh, SAP out of, uh, out of Germany. Yes, so uh, to the extent that this facilitates, cloud computing facilitates startups in other places, it's perfect for us. To the extent that it tends to be pulling everyone to the United States and that there's a few big companies dominating, that doesn't come so, nice, so, so easily to me. But certainly software has been great for us. I mean, software, software startups, business um, application software, that we have a lot of people we worked with in Brazil, for example, who have some, some part of that um, as, 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 as their business. And we're, we're always looking for more. Outside of the U.S. to to give help them get their gain critical mass to expand globally. I'm open if you. I'm open to any and all ideas. And I mean, we have a we have a business development team or a project development team that will. If you've got leads, even if they're very vague leads, give them to us and we'll follow up. I mean, this this is how we find projects and keep this going. Mm-hmm. Judy, this is restricted to companies starting out, and whether or not there's space for organizations that actually. I'm thinking of some of the smaller nonprofits in the developing world that have to diversify their funding streams by bringing new products and services to the market that will generate revenue largely through third party payers, but to offset their dependence on donors who are now scaling back tremendously. So it's a whole new world out there. Yeah. And it's sort of more of a Peace Corps maybe for these people, but, but um, 
I need help. <laughs> yeah, so uh, I, I like to call those hybrid models, actually. So it's not just, it's not a non-profit standard, just somebody running a hospital. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a non-profit, um, it's a chain of pharmacies that has a for-profit angle, but also is very motivated by trying to share with the poorer, poorer yeah, community. And then they have a then they have a for profit wing. Look, we'll, we'll try anything like that. I mean, that is we we have learned those projects are tougher when you when you do the hybrids, uh, and you have to make sure the students who are picking that project know what they're getting into. Now, some of our students come with strong non profit experience, and they're very comfortable with that. Um, but uh, so I, I would I don't think that's going to be ever the majority of what we do. But there's absolutely room for some of that on on the, in the portfolio. And if that lets us go to places that are different places and places that the students find interesting. And, and where they can be, op where they can operate and be effective, I'm absolutely all, all for it. You just give me the details. Yes, sure. About the time, you said that you start in September, and then the guys will go in January. January. So I assume the project is not a, it is a real job kind of project, but it's not a you know, six, six months for the company. It's a lot of time. So it's like a medium-term project, I guess. Well, right. So, so. Students sometimes say, why don't we line up the projects in May, show them what they are in May, and so on. And that, that's far too long, right? So we, we need, what, we, we, we have tried different versions of this. And, and we need to get the students organized and into the, into the projects. And we need the projects to get running. I would say that by early October, the students really have to be on the ball and knowing where it's going. So I, I got a fair ramp time to that. Um, they, they, they should be. It, I mean, it only makes sense for the company because I want you them to pay money, right? It only makes sense if it's a, an important issue, as in, what do I do next? But you're right, it's not today's problem. It's not the operational problem of the moment. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a little bit more strategical, but, but, it, but it needs to be actionable. It's what you, th you know, I really need to go to the next market or the next city in Italy or whatever it is, right? Um, but I'm, I can't quite do this by myself, or I can do it by myself, but it'd be really helpful to have these MIT guys come and look, kick it around and see, does it make sense? How would I do it? How would I structure it? Or maybe I have a choice. I could either go to Colombia or Peru. Hmm, both of them have appeal. I have guys telling me to go one way or the other. Let me bring in some referees and, and have them just research it. And, and, and it's a sounding board. It's a sounding board, exactly, right. Um, so I think that's a, that's a really good way to use them. When they're on the ground in January, they will be at high speed, running, matching the clock speed of the entrepreneur. That's my, that's my goal, and I think that's what works. Mm -hmm. So then they can also do things, but we want the project to be what they're prepared to do primarily and what they're, um, and what they're um, what they focused on doing. We do urge them to uh, adapt and, 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 and apply mm -hmm. and react to what they see and what they hear. Um, and we do try and impress on them the, how well you do if you overachieve. If you set some specific focused goals and you deliver them, and then you deliver something else. By the way, you say Colombia and Peru. Well, here's the comparison. It's actually Peru, but you haven't thought at all about Chile. And this is, I mean, really, you should look more at Chile. You say, oh, well, I, I just wasn't, wasn't thinking about that. So anything that kind of stretches people's thinking, there's a big, there's a big payoff from, from that. Yes? Yes, regarding with different topics, I wonder if it's uh, possible to apply this uh, actual ranking in teaching more theoretical subjects, like the science, for example, math or physics. Do you have some experience or, or just not yet? To... Yes, so the, um, uh, uh, this method of learning is also used in those capac in, you know, uh, in that capacity as well. Um, within uh, within Sloan, we have this management education, you know, can focus. But certainly within, um, you know, um, uh, middle schools, high schools, uh, other you know colleges, they are using uh, some something similar to this. Oh, so you're saying you apply action learning to different sciences? Mm -hmm. Okay, all right. I thought I, thought I, I was supposed to come up with a G Lab project where I was going to transform <laughs> physics, uh, which which will be harder. But we have, we do have. I mean, I, I also was thinking. You made me think about education. We've had education yes. projects. Enki Education was one of the ones in South Africa, based in South Africa, aiming for Francophone Africa, Africa yeah. particularly uh, West Africa. So. New models of organizing education, delivering education, mm -hmm. which you might think of as being non-profit traditionally, but some of, this can, uh, some of these models obviously in the, out there in the world are for-profit mm -hmm. models. That's also something that our students are very, very interested in. And then applying technology to education, right? Figuring out how do we do education, for example, corporate education, using 
the latest best software, but applied to our local country realities. That, that's also been a good place for us. Yes? It's a model that could work best, you know, in a model between companies. I mean, I don't want to put you out of business, but I thought, uh -huh. <laughs> is, it, is, it, is this model replicable in companies working uh, with each other? So company E would send people to company B to work on a problem and vice versa. Or do you miss the structure and the learning that goes uh, ah, That's a good question. You guys uh, can so reflect on that. So I, I would say so, um, when action learning is done in the corporate sector, it tends to be internal. So that the, you're, you're identifying your high potentials within a company and it's a way to give them uh, a, a particular experience that will help them move to the le next level within their than their company. And so it typically in the corporate sector is within a company and you may be working across uh, different divisions, for example, to give you that experience. In terms of companies exchanging with each other, no, I've never heard I of it. I think is it the... Maybe another industry could even sort of bring... Hey, I'm in favor, favor of all the above. But I think there's a neutrality to having the students do it. There's an MIT student coming, even though the student may go off and work for various other kinds of people, and even though we strenuously resist, attempts to have us sign non-disclosure agreements. Mm -hmm. We will, under some, under some circumstances, mm -hmm. MIT will sign an NDA with the company. Always. Um, right. and, and we do expect the highest professional standards, of course, from our students, including not leaking or using confidential information. Um, but this, there's a neutrality. There's a student, there's a group of students. They want to come. They want to learn. This is part of a course. There's a professor. You can call the professor and say, hey, what's the learning here? How does this work as a part of the education? That's what we've just talked to you about. Uh, people are very comfortable with that, and people like interacting with MIT on that basis. And I think that um, there's a bit, it's just a kind of, um, we're not in it for the money, in, in a, and I'm going to make profit off this particular idea. We are much more in it to help people learn. And we do want the companies to learn from the students, as well as vice versa. That's a good trade. I think between companies is, I mean, you can tell me if I have it wrong. I think that's a more awkward more awkward uh, and, and that's, not and natural I think it's, it's a different model, um, which I'm happy to talk with you about afterwards. Right. But it's, it's La last question, last question. Yeah. From someone who hasn't asked a question, from someone who hasn't spoken already, uh, who, uh, uh, On this? yes, please. So, um, so I'm from Brazil, and I think uh, consumer goods, specifically RC, responsible consumption, is a huge market. Uh, if you see the numbers for the US, for example, one fifth of the consumption is already RC. I mean, that's at least the number I have. And RC? Uh, responsible consumption, so it's organic, natural, social social trade, fair trade. And I'm in the cosmetics business. And, and the numbers in Brazil, for example, are just like 2 or 3%. And I believe that smaller companies, not A brands like P&G or Deliver, are like really into these markets. So it would be great like for organic, some like, you know, developed world. Uh, you so know, we, have huge, we have huge student interest in this. We'd yeah. love to find more projects. I also run a, a, a course. Uh, a case-based course or a classroom discussion-based course that runs in parallel to this, where we talk to entrepreneurs from around the world, and, and this would be, give, give me some suggestions for people who would like to talk about what's happening, where it's happening, and, and we always try to pick up trends. We try to look for ideas, we try to look for models, we try to look for places, particularly places that aren't obvious to people. We had a great entrepreneur come to that class uh, last year, a student, and the students suggest some of those sessions. I put, we put together some as faculty, the students suggest others. We had an entrepreneur come together who was working in Bhutan. Mm -hmm. He's doing digital, digital photo, digital um, right. digitization of, of, of photos right. and helping you manage your vast collection of photos that you have in shoeboxes. This guy will digitize it all and he'll help you build beautiful products with your own photos. He does some of it, he sells it to you in the US. Uh, um, and, and they have a very good name in the US. They do some of it in Bangalore. They do more and more of it in Bhutan. So he came and told us about Bhutan. I didn't know anything about Bhutan. It was a student's idea to find this guy. He was very much into um, responsible. It, it wasn't, I mean, if you go to Bhutan, you have to be responsible. I think that's, that's the point. The government insists on it. But he would kind of internalized that too, and he's very comfortable. And he talked about how, how he got the right kind of workforce or what he was trying to do, and so on. Um, so, and that, that was a great discussion. So any, any, any and all of these dimensions, frontiers, places, ideas, trends, technologies, the crazier the better, as far as I'm concerned. The ultimate test, I find, always for whether or not something is plausible, is gonna work, is put it right here in front of a group of Sloan MBAs for 90 minutes and see if they walk out saying, hmm, yeah, interesting, I think it's got something, or if they walk out on the way out, they say to me, uh, Simon, this is really 
not a good idea. Then, you know, it goes in the file cabinet at the back of my office and we don't mention it ever again. So send us, send us the ideas. Send us the ideas. Send us the companies. Send us the places. If you want to be involved, if you want to do a little bit of this or a lot of this, or just send me an email or have a friend send me an email, or somebody come, you meet somebody on a plane who has a crazy idea, send them to us. It's all, we're absolutely fascinated by all of it. Our students want to go do more and more of this great stuff around the world. And, and I, we thank all of you for everything you've done personally and, and collectively to get us all to this point. So thank you very much. Thank you. And, and I hope you're all coming to the reception, which is just going to be down here on this floor, down uh, the far end uh, facing the river. Yes? Good? OK. Thank you very much. <laughs>